Divine Truth. The name of this presentation is The Eternal Benefits, and it is part of the Relationship with God series. It was presented in Bathurst, New South Wales, Australia, on the 16th of June, 2012. This is Session 1, Part 1. Okay, nice little intimate group, got a very good subject for you today. So um, we're, we're uh, very happy to be here in uh, Bathurst and uh, we've just come across from Sydney last week and we had, I don't, I don't know, there would have been 50 or 60 people in Sydney, uh, 50 people probably that we talked to in Sydney last week and uh, had a couple of discussions about spirituality, true spirituality and pseudo-spirituality, which should be on the net soon. And today what I would like to speak with you about, though, is a, is a subject that's dear to my heart, actually. It's a part of the relationship... ..with God series of talks that I've been giving. And the subject is... Um, the eternal benefits of a relationship with God. So that's, uh, that's the subject. What, what I find when I discuss relationship with God with people is that generally most people don't understand the potential benefits of the relationship and so most people don't view it as a very important part of their lives. And so what, you know, this is why eventually religion sort of starts to have this concept of, oh, I'll go along Sunday and that, you know, that's my contribution or, or the development of my relationship with God on one day of the week. And one of the main reasons why that happens is because there is really on earth very little concept of the benefits of having a relationship with God. And... And very little concept of how wide-reaching this relationship with God will have an effect in your entire life. And, uh, and so that's why when it, in the first century we called the relationship with God the way. The reason why we called it the way was because it wasn't just something that you practiced occasionally. But it was, it was the way you lived your entire life. And, and this is something that... Most people, I feel, with, when it comes to talking about a relationship with God, most people have a lot of difficulty with the concept of how a relationship with God will benefit them. So what we'd like to do today is focus on the benefits, the benefits of having a relationship with God rather than just sort of talking about the relationship with God. We're going to look at what are the overall benefits. And the benefits uh, are basically... The benefits can be measured in a number of different ways. Firstly, the scope of the benefits is interesting because the scope of the benefits range from tiny minor changes in our life, so from minor right the way through to, to massive things that occur in our life as a result of the relationship. And when I say massive, I'm talking about uh, so large that they affect the universe. In, in terms of massive, not just our galaxy or our solar system, but the entire universe. 
And so the scope of having a relationship with God in terms of the effect it's going to have on the universe itself is actually quite massive. We also, in terms of our personal, in terms of how personal it is, it, it, it ranges from being completely intimate in the sense that in the sense that we are totally intimately involved in the relationship, right the way through to universal in, in its scope. So, so there will be things that affect us so personally, intimately, that we can't even describe them to another person properly. That's how intimate it will be. But there are also things that uh, will affect every single person in the universe as a result of our relationship with God. So our relationship with God can actually have an impact upon every single being in the universe, not just upon ourselves. So for that reason, it, there's a very, very large area that, that it encompasses our relationship with God. And in terms of timing, the effects of our relationship with God begin from immediate... to everlasting. In other words, there are, some thing, uh, there are some things that will affect our relationship with God immediately and therefore affect our life immediately as we embrace them. But some of the choices we make in our relationship with God actually are going to have an effect on your entire everlasting future. Some of the choices that you make right now even will have an effect on your entire everlasting future when you embrace relationship with God. So, so what I'd like to do is discuss some of the parts about a relationship with God with you and, and, and we can relate them to some of these, what you'd call characteristics of how the relationship affects the rest of our life. In addition, I'd like to talk to you about some of the changes that occur that we're perhaps not that aware of or that we've not been potentially aware of in terms of the potential of our relationship with God and how far it can go. Because most people on earth, again, um, we have a very limited relationship with God due to a number of constraints that we place upon it. And unfortunately, due to those constraints, we never get to experience the full impact of the relationship with God and what it can do to our lives. And as a result of that, we have a tendency then to put it uh, as a secondary part in our life rather than a primary part of our life. It always reminds me a little of, of a comment that was made in the, the, um, the books, that Conversations with God. I don't know if any of you have read those particular books, but there was one comment that uh, he made, Neil Donald Walsh made to God, so-called God in the conversation, was that, was that he said he'd been wanting God to be involved in his life for all of his life. And God said to him, well, no, that's not really the case. Because if you, think, if you add up all the minutes of time that uh, we often think about God or desire a relationship with God, often we may have a general feeling that pervades all of our life, but if we add up the actual time that we spend on the relationship, a lot of times it's a very, very short part or small part of our life. And, and it may even add up to only weeks in our entire life that we're really dedicated to developing a relationship with God. And the problem with that, of course, is that we never get to experience the results of a good relationship with God. And what I find on earth is that most people don't ever get to experience the results of a good relationship with God. And so it, it, other things then take priority. So if we look at it from, the, from this perspective... If we make God our number one priority in our life, that is certainly going to change a lot of our life immediately. The way that we spend our time will change immediately if we make God our number one priority in our life and our relationship with God that number one priority. If we do that, there are certain benefits that come from doing that. And what we need to do is analyse those benefits to see what are the benefits of doing that. If we put God, as most people do, down on the priority list of their life, then 
of course it would make sense that the benefits are not going to be as great because it's like having a relationship, if you like, with any other person or being that surrounds us. Obviously, if we're not that dedicated to the relationship, then of course the relationship isn't as close as it could be, potentially. And therefore, the benefits of having such a relationship are not going to be able to be measured as, as well. So what we'd like to do is to examine the benefits in terms of the true benefits and present some benefits that you may not have even thought about with regard to the, having a relationship with God. And then at the end, we'd like to ask, look, given these benefits, why would we delay developing such a relationship? So that's the general course of our action today. Is there any questions that you have at this point about that? So I'm happy to answer any questions all the way through our discussion. Now, I've, I've made an outline which is downloadable on the, on the net. Um, so everything is downloadable that we do on the net from the www.divinetruth. And I hope to update it this week, the, uh, the details that we talk about today. So you can go there and downline, download the actual outline. So you don't need to make that many notes about what we're going to do. If you can just sort of be absorbed in the discussion rather than making notes, you'll probably find that um, you'll benefit a lot from the discussion. Okay. Sure, fire away. Um, just wait for the mic, though, if you can, because we just need to record the voice. Oh, it came to my mind when you're talking about uh, a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. um, number one, what are we relating to? How would you find this to relate to? And... Does the word relating, a relationship with God imply a separation to begin with? If, if you're relating to God as it's me and the other, I have some confusion about that. Do you get me? No worries. Yes, I do. I do get you. Firstly, um, God is an entity. A, a being. Far, far greater than we are as an individual. In other words, we're very limited as individuals. We have the capacity to grow, but God has already obviously grown enough to have all of this knowledge and all of this wisdom and all this power and all this understanding and all this love as well for all of her creations. And as an entity, she has personality. She has uh, attributes, qualities, characteristics that we can define. Now, today I'm not going to go so much into that, but what I want to do firstly is present the concept that God is the entity... And we are an entity. And we have our own individual nature, our own individual qualities, our own individual attributes, our own individual personality and so forth. That being the case, we can relate to any other entity. And how, so, so, for example, you're an entity, I'm an entity, so here was two entities. We can relate with each other somehow. Now, if our relating together is based upon fear and, uh, and dishonesty and a lot of other, other attributes like that, then obviously our relationship is going to be very poor. We're going to probably not want to be in each other's life very much. We're going to be uh, very, very limited in terms of what we do together in our life. We'll do things separate from each other. So separateness is only created by our inability to relate with each other in a loving manner. And it's exactly the same with our relationship with God, I believe, in that separateness is only created by our own inability to relate to God in a loving manner. And God is always desirous of relating to us in a loving manner and, and of course, created us out of love. So, so, so when it comes to a relationship with God, God herself or himself, depending on how you want to view God, um, God can relate to us with love all the time, but our ability to actually have a relationship in return with God is very much defined by how willing we are to embrace that love and have that love enter us, but also have a feeling of love that comes from us to God. Just like having a relationship with a person would be limited by how willing we are to, to interact with, with the individual. So if you consider God as an entity or a being, and you are an entity or a being, 
Separateness is only created by our inability to engage the relationship in a loving way. And, and if you look on earth, generally, most of mankind does have an inability to engage a relationship with God in a loving manner. In fact, most of mankind believe God or believes God to be some kind of rageful, punishing being. And uh, in fact, most religious forms on the earth believe that to be the case. And so immediately they're, they're saying that God is not the loving creature that God knows herself to be. And I'm going to then start relating to somebody, something that isn't a, even existing at that point. So once I start saying to God that you are a punishing, angry, rageful God... Now what I'm doing to God is I'm defining God by my own methods rather than actually having a relationship and finding out about God from God herself. So in a human relationship, if I came along and told you everything about yourself that I believed you were without actually relating with you and finding out who you are through the relationship, then, then that would be a pretty arrogant stance, wouldn't it? Like We'd never be able to have a very good relationship. And it's really the same with most people's relationship with God, they basically finish up telling God what God is and then believing and creating a whole form of worship of that being based around what they believe God to be. So what, what I'm su suggesting instead is that we are an entity, God is an entity. We, are, we have separate attributes and characteristics which we can share. There are certain things, qualities, that we can share. Love being the greatest of those qualities, if you like. And... What we can do is engage the process of allowing God's love. So what, what I would call the divine love that comes from the divine to enter us. And then also having feelings of love of our own. And, and therefore uh, feelings that we establish towards God. That God then can feel. So... I can, I can feel God's love entering me and I can also feel my love for God and actually feel when God accepts that. And of course God's going to accept that all the time because God's not injured in love. And so we, our relationship with God is not dependent upon God. It's actually dependent upon this entity, us, whoever we are. And any separateness we have from God is completely constructed by our own inability to engage that relationship in a loving manner. Does that make sense? So, so my feelings are more that God is an entity, a being whom, with whom we can have a to and from relationship. In other words, with whom we can feel feelings from and have feelings towards. And whether that actually occurs is completely dependent upon myself and whether I'm willing to engage that relationship in a loving manner. And if I'm not willing to engage that relationship in a loving and truthful manner, in other words, I'm going, if I'm going to believe things about God that are false, or I'm going to try to push upon God my beliefs about God, then obviously the relationship's not going to be very close. But if I can accept God's definition of God into myself from God through this relationship, then I can have a very, very close bond with God. And in fact, a bond that could grow everlastingly, something that can grow over a long, long period of time and continue to escalate in its value and also in its experience with us. And that's really what I'm pointing, pointing towards when I'm talking about a relationship with God. Yeah? Does that explain? Yes, yeah. Yep. I mean, I have problems with the word God. Right? I understand. Because there are so many concepts that throwing around... That it's almost like it's become a, a dirty word. It people. has become a dirty word in you know Western I mean? society, in particular. And um, so I, I find I'm not totally comfortable with that word. That three-letter word. So rather than uh, if we instead of take this word as like man's definition of the word, you know, this somehow all-powerful, omnipotent. Well, I mean, I feel that like this L saying, man, man, uh, God made man in his image, right? They reversed it and they said, man has made God in his image. Exactly. Yeah. In fact, man has made God even worse than their image in most cases because most of the time they actually, man <coughs> actually believes that God is even more destructive than they themselves would be. So, you know, they've even made God to be even something worse than the average man. 
And, uh, and that concept of God, I feel, is very, very flawed. So instead, perhaps if we can define it a bit better, God being the creator of the universe and therefore the creator of us is the, person, is the being I'm speaking of, basically who is the source of all life and, and our existence and, in fact, uh, the source of all laws as well in terms of universal law, not, not the laws man creates but rather the laws that are uh, present in nature. And so the creator or source um, has personality. In other words, it's a person, it's a being that we can cre- connect to and actually feel the nature of through the connection. Um, and that's what I'm talking about when I'm speaking about God. It, it, that person is also separate to me in the sense that we are different individuals. I can have a will that is in opposition to God. So in other words, we, this God has it, their own will, right? its own will, and I have my own will, and sometimes I can exercise my will in the complete opposite direction to what God would like to see me exercise my will if I was in harmony with love. That being the case, God has her own will and therefore has the ability to do whatever she desires and wishes based on her power and the love that she has. That, that is, that is irref, irrespective of what I decide to do. Um, so that being the case, when this entity, me, <laughs> decides to somehow try to develop a relationship with this entity, God, the entity that existed before the universe even existed itself, then then when that occurs, I can somehow enter this relationship where I receive feelings from God and I can also enter this relationship in a manner where I can feel feelings for God that God then also receives and feels. And that's what I mean by a relationship. And when we begin the relationship, quite often we don't feel much from God and God doesn't feel much from us because most of the time we've got other relationships that are more important or whatever. But over a period of time, as we recognise the importance of this relationship, and one of the reasons why we do is is understanding the benefits of it, once we develop this relationship further and further, what happens is it it obviously grows in terms of the priority of of our life and eventually... Uh, my feelings are that once you, once you eventually grow in that place, you will eventually get to the point where the relationship with God is more important than anything else. More important than anything else you can do because you realise that it has an effect on everything you do and so forth. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm speaking of a relationship with God. I'm not talking about a relationship with the universe because I feel the universe is God's creation and therefore I'm having a relationship, when I have a relationship with the universe, I'm having a relationship with the creation of God, not with God itself or herself or himself. So I have the ability to have a relationship with the actual person, the being who created the universe. And a a relationship with that being has eternal benefits to my life. And what we want to do is discover what those benefits are. It's highly unlikely that if we don't see there's any benefits that we'd ever engage the relationship. It's like if you, if you see uh, potential benefits of having a relationship with a person on earth, then you'll, you'll engage the relationship most of the time. You, you'll want to do, do things with them and get to know them and get to understand them and have them understand you and you've opened with them and more trusting with them and so forth because you can see the benefits of doing so. But if there was no benefits to doing so, if there, if there were no benefits from ad- addressing a relationship with an individual, then you wouldn't decide to generally address the relationship most of the time. For most of us, that would be the case. And I'm suggesting the same thing really happens with God if we don't see the benefits of having a relationship with God then we have a tendency to have relationships with everyone else other than God until such a time as we see the benefits yep that's a good question okay is there any other questions before now bearing in mind that this being is the creator of everything there's got to be some pretty major benefits of having a relationship with such a being if this relationship is personal and not just a general idea or concept. So, so I would say the very first thing that we, we need to discuss is what, what 
the major, the major benefit is we have a relationship with the actual creator or the potential of having one with the actual creator of the universe. Now, the creator of the universe knows everything <laughs> that's inside of the universe. Because he created it. Now, if I have a relationship with that creator, I then have the potential to somehow learn everything that he knows. And if I have that potential, then in the end, I can get to know everything in the universe as well. Absolutely everything. How, scientifically, mathematically, creatively, everything that's possible that we can engage because this creator knows everything and has created the potential for everything in the universe that we live in, it would make sense that if I have a relationship with this person, this being, then I have the potential to learn everything from that being through this relationship. Now, if that's the case, then there, to me that is one of the greatest possible reasons to engage the relationship. So I'm not talking about just having a sort of a religious concept. So I'm not talking about generally just a religious concept. You know this general concept that mankind has about God, or you have to worship God. I'm more talking about something that's much more personal than that where you actually can feel God's nature, qualities and attributes, and God educates you through the relationship, rather than just it being a case of you having to go to church Sunday or go and worship God or honour God. Because it's not just about honouring God. I feel it's more than that. It's about growing in this relationship where we have a to and fro conversation with God. Where, where everything between us and God flows in terms of emotionally flows. Just like you would have a relationship with a person who's your partner or a friend, you can have a relationship with God which will encompass and, and make you grow in all sorts of directions that you wouldn't have conceived possible before. And the reason why is because God knows everything where we live about where we live and god knows everything about our body god knows everything about our spirit body god knows everything about our soul god knows everything about our personality god knows everything about the world in which we live scientifically he knows everything that he created he created the mathematics and the science he knows all of those things so the more i come closer to this being god who knows all these things it would logically make sense that I will also grow in my knowledge of exactly those same things. And, there, and it would be much easier for me to do so than connecting with any other person. So it, it also helps me, if you like, prevents me from... It, I, I need to do less experimentation. When I say less, what I mean by that is, in my life... The way I generally learn is by experimenting, right? I, I experiment with something, a concept, an idea, and eventually I test it through a lot of different actions that I might take. And eventually I arrive at generally what I believe to be true as a result of those experiments. The beauty of having a direct connection with God is that God can tell me things that I then can experiment with that, that I don't have to go and discover for myself as much. And what that means then is I have the potential to learn more rapidly. I have the potential to learn about the entire universe much more rapidly than I would by having to experiment on my own right. Does that make sense? I could potentially learn directly from the being who created it and therefore understand it much more easily than I could have potentially understood before. And, and so that then makes things a lot more, it makes my growth a lot faster as a result. I can grow faster and grow towards understanding things faster through this relationship. Is there any questions you have about that? So how, how do you guys feel about a relationship with God, like in terms of a concept, like, 
Um, I was just, just reflecting that it's about having the willingness to learn from God because in my self-reliance, the way I've done everything in this life is not to ask anybody anything. <laughs> yeah. Just live by trial and error. Exactly. And my observation is that that's what most of us do. Yeah. And um, I don't know why that's so ingrained, but it's been a real switch for me to, to go from that I have to do everything kind of thing to, yeah. to in this case, accepting, well, God knows everything and I can learn that way. It's that... It's that switch, it's that willingness to want and that desire to want to do that. Yes, like I drew earlier, you know, how there's me and uh, I can live in a bubble, if we like, when it comes to God. I can, uh, or live, you know, by learning from the world around me. The problem with that, of course, is I have to experiment with it. And the other problem is that I'll generally attract a whole thing, series of events which I then interpret a certain way and because my interpretations are not are not universal in their nature, I will often misinterpret it. So I will, I, will, I will often not have a good perspective, if you like. It's like when you stand here on the mount at Bathurst, you can, you can overlook the entire valley and so see how the valley is laid out. But when you go down into the valley and just live in the valley, you, can't, you, you forget how everything's laid out like, because... It, because of you being actually in the valley and the perspective has changed. And if we gain God's perspective, that is a universal perspective. It's a very different type of perspective than our individual perspective. And through this relationship with God, we have the potential to actually see everything as God sees it. And in that process, we have the ability to see it as it really is. Because that's how God sees everything. Right? But instead, what we often do is we forget about God, forget about a relationship with God on earth, and then we only have the ability to see it how we see it. And how we see is often quite limited and distorted because of our perspective, because of where we are even living in the universe. There is a certain degree of distortion that occurs through what we observe. And whereas with God, we get to, if we connect to, to God, we, we get to see things how God sees them, which is a very, very different perspective than how we generally see it ourselves. And I feel that's a major benefit of, of our, our relationship with God, to actually begin to see things as they really are, rather than how I interpret them to be. Um, now, to do that, I've got to be pretty humble. I've got to be also pretty... Like not very self-reliant and more God-reliant in that in that interpretation. But uh, but again, if I have a relationship with God, I could even develop those qualities of being less self-reliant, more God-reliant, more humble in my relationship with God, more willing to learn like a student, rather than thinking that that I know everything and therefore don't need to be taught anything. Those kind of things. And if I have a relationship with God, then I'm completely free to be taught everything. Everything that's possible to learn in any possible direction of, or passion that I have. And that includes music, art, science, mathematics, any passion, passion you can consider. We have the ability to learn the truth of it and ability to utilise it in a, in a loving manner if we connect to this relationship with God. Yeah. Okay, is there any other questions or statements you'd like to make about that? Okay. So, if God sees things as it really, as they really are, and this is me, and I have this limited uh, viewpoint of how things are, obviously, through this relationship with God, certain things are going to be, if I embrace it with this relationship, th certain things are going to be forced upon me. One of the things that will be forced upon me to, to is that I will need to change. In other words. I need to change from the limited being I currently are into a completely different type of being who has the ability to absorb the information that God wants to give us. So I see God as the same as any human parent on earth who is loving towards their child. And when I say the same, far exceeds any loving person on earth who's loving towards their child. Now any parent who's loving towards their child on earth generally wants their child to learn the easiest possible way. Is that not the case? You're always trying to protect your child 
from having hardship through the process of learning. You, you, you want them to learn even from your own experience to a degree so that they don't have or embrace the same problems that you've had to experience in your life with learning. There's also this feeling that is in most, of, most good parents on earth who are loving towards their children that they would like the child to even exceed their own understanding of things in the long run. They want to, in fact, most good parents want to create a, what, what I would call an atmosphere or an environment of learning so it's so easy for the child to learn that, uh, that the child just automatically absorbs new truths without even realising it sometimes, just through this process of learning. And I feel God is far better than the average parent on earth. So therefore, God wants us to also absorb new truths and God wants us to do it as easily as we possibly can. And the easiest possible way we could absorb more truth is by having a relationship with God where there is a to and from emotional experience between us and God and a learning experience between us and God. And as that experience occurs, now we have the ability to, to understand a whole heap of new things that we would not have before been able to understand without that relationship. And that relationship with God will also challenge us in certain ways. So, for example, let's have a look how it will challenge me. There are some truths that God knows, and obviously, if we can put it even more defined than that, there must be an infinite number of truths that this being must know to create what seems or appears to be an infinite universe. And if that is the case, then there is an infinite number of truths that can be transmitted from God to me. But for me to be able to absorb them, I'm going to have to change. I'm going to have to be in a condition to absorb them somehow. My, my intellect, for example, is going to have to grow in order to absorb some of these truths. My experience of emotions is going to have to grow in order for me to experience some of these truths. Because if it doesn't grow, then how can I get the truth from God that God already experiences and knows without there being some kind of growth on my part? So, so what I see is the, one of the benefits of our relationship with God is that it causes me to grow. I'm going to grow in my intellectual capacity to understand. I'm going to grow in my emotional capacity to understand every single thing. I will not, in fact, if I continue with this relationship with God, the soul will be, my soul will be transformed in such a way that I have the capacity to understand things that I now currently do not understand. So right now there's a whole he heap of things, because we're not God, we obviously, there must be a whole almost infinite number of things that we don't understand. Like if you look at most of us, most of us have no idea how our, how our body works even. Many times we don't even know the purpose of an organ in our body that's a major organ, let alone how our entire body works. When we get sick, we don't understand why most of the time. We, we blame it on a flu or a virus or something like that, but we have no understanding of why we caught it. Because if we understood why we caught it and, and understood there is a cause, we would remove that cause and then we'd never catch one again. Right, So we don't even understand why we caught it. We, we, don't, we, we don't have the capacity even for many of us to understand. What I'm saying is a relationship with God can grow our soul in such a manner that we have the capacity to understand why these things happen. And therefore we have the capacity to change them. We have the capacity to influence our life in so many different areas of change as a result. Does that make sense? Okay. Is there any questions? You're all just sitting there quiet, quiet. Is this because you're uh, bored or is it because you're <laughs> absorbed? <laughs> Hopefully. Um, so with our relationship with God then, there must be quite a lot of benefits of engaging the relationship. So what I would like to do is talk to you about the benefits of engaging the relationship in a lot more detail rather than how to engage the relationship. I've given many other talks about how to engage the relationship. 
what I would like to do today is just discuss the benefits of engaging the relationship with you. And I feel that if we understand the benefits, it gives us a greater motivation to engage the relationship rather than just sort of sitting back and waiting for God to do something to, to bring the relationship to us. And I often li liken it inside of myself to a relationship between two people. Like, you imagine, you, do you remember the first time you met somebody who you eventually fell in love with? The very first time you met. Now, for most people, when they meet them, there's some level of attraction, isn't there? Like, you know, the other person might be on the other side of the room or you might see them walking down the street or you might see them at the pub or somewhere where you've initially met. And, and there's an initial level of attraction. So there you are, maybe if, it's, uh, if you're a male, there you are. And there's the person who you feel attra is, you're attracted to. Right? Whether that person's a male or female is immaterial to me. But there's a person who you're attracted to and you feel some level of attraction for. Now, if you just sit down and just watch them, and you don't engage that attraction in any way, what's the chances of something further happening in that relationship? Very little. Isn't that the case? Now, they may finish up noticing you looking at them, and in some cases, they might actually feel quite creeped out about it. And, uh, and in fact, it'd be a, a thing that causes them to even step away further from you. For the actual relationship to occur, this person, if this person's the person who feels the initial attraction towards this person, that person, if they're shy, would probably do what? They'd probably just covertly look at the person from a distance without freaking them out, without creeping them out. They'd, but oftentimes they wouldn't engage the person, would they? They'd just watch them from a distance often. Now, many people, and, I know, and you might have been one of them in your life at some point, have actually sometimes watched a person from a distance without engaging them in any way for years before any relationship is established. Right? And there's been plenty of people that have done that in their life. Before, for a relationship to be established, this person has to do what? has to take action. And what does that action involve, generally? And if, well, if we can use some microphones here, they say, you want to... Uh, it would involve something with the person, so go up to the person, call the person. So they'd have to expose themselves to a degree, wouldn't they? They'd have yes. to be open enough to expose that they're actually interested, interested. in the person, yeah. wouldn't they, in some way. So, so there would be a degree of heart being exposed, wouldn't there, in that process. They have to expose themselves through this action somehow. Yeah. And sometimes uh, it, the exposure is so natural because we feel the attraction and because we feel the attraction, we automatically... You know, it shows on our face and it shows in our body language and it shows... And so the other person can often... We're, we're all already exposing ourselves, even through the attraction, most of the time. And then if, when we take further action about it, we then expose ourselves to the person. So we're, we're taking a... What, what I would call a risk. Are we not? <laughs> we're risking potential rejection, we're risking you know, someone laughing at us or humiliating us. And there's all sorts of things we're risking, but we're willing to take the risk. Why? Because we feel there is going to be some kind of benefit to doing so, whatever that benefit would be. Now, if we take action and we take that risk and we, we let our attraction be known to the other person, then having a relationship with that person is dependent upon them also feeling something in return, is it not? So they would have to feel some kind of attraction or at least some kind of interest 
in order for us to spend more time together and start to get to know each other and so forth, that would have to occur at some point. Now, if we just take this person out of the picture now and we're talking about an attraction, a relationship with God, God already has the feelings of wanting a relationship. In other words, God already has the feelings of love for us, of compassion for us, of understanding us. And so forth. There's all these feelings that God has for us already. God is not injured in the sense that God is not worried about rejection. So God's not afraid of you rejecting God. You're allowed to reject God at any time and God has, does not change her opinion of you. God does not change the way she interacts with you because she's loving. And a person who loves doesn't change just by the result of somebody else and what they do. So you can cheat on God, for example, if, if we could use that term, and God would not be upset. Right? We could be dishonest with God and God wouldn't get into a rage because God has all these feelings of love and compassion and understanding for us. So, so let's, if we look at relationship, can you see that God or the creator or the source, whatever you would like to call God, is not injured, so is not injured in love. God does not have emotional injuries in the way that God expresses love. Now, when we enter some kind of a relationship with a person on earth, most of the time, the person on earth that we're entering a relationship with does have injuries with regard to love. It's very rare to find a person who doesn't have an injury with regard to love on the earth. The reason why is the person has grown up in an environment that often certain things that were said to be loving occurred which weren't actually loving, where rage was expressed towards the person and they then were told that it was love to be angry, um, which is not true but that's what the person comes to believe and sometimes it even becomes so bad that the person believes that violence is love where they actually believe somebody loves them when they express uh, sort of violence or angry emotions to them and they believe that's love so the person potentially the other person and including ourselves we potentially are going to be injured in love and this thing that God is not injured in love is a very important point if we develop a relationship with God and God is not injured in love, then we, to develop the relationship, are going to have to let go of all of our emotional injuries about love to actually have the relationship. And so God will be able to teach us everything about our injuries with regard to love because God is not injured in love. The problem with engaging a relationship with a person is that there's a high potential of this person being injured in love somehow. And so we can engage the relationship, but through that relationship we're not always going to learn about our own injuries in love. Because this person may believe certain things are good when they're actually not loving. And we may finish up taking on that instead. But when we develop a relationship with God, because God's not injured in love... I know that if I can't feel God's love, there's got to be something wrong inside of myself that's blocking it, that's rejecting it. And if I can't feel God's nature and qualities and attributes, there's got to be a reason inside of myself that causes me to not feel those particular things. And so what that does is this relationship then can teach me It first teaches me about love, right? 
Because God's not injured in love, if I cannot feel love coming from God, there's got to be a reason inside of myself that I'm blocking it. But it also finishes up teaching me about other things like truth, for example, universal truth, knowledge, the knowledge of the universe. Because every time I think something that is in error or believe something that is in error about God or the universe, then obviously I'll be blocking God so there'll be an automatic feedback system that teaches me that my opinion is incorrect. So it can teach me truth. And it can also teach me many other things that I need to learn about. It can give me knowledge as a result of the way that it teaches me. So one of the most powerful benefits of having a relationship with God is that it's a great way to discover truth. Because the relationship can only main, be maintained while we are in a truthful condition. God's always in a truthful condition. God always sees everything, remember, as it really is, which is truth. So God always sees everything as it really is. If we don't see it the same way, then eventually it will block our relationship with God in some way and that will give us some feedback and that will tell us that we're out of harmony with how things really are from God's perspective. So we can learn everything about how things really are through that relationship. And I see that as a major benefit of having a relationship with God. Okay. Any questions about that? No worries. Most of us have a lot of trouble in our lives. Is that not true? Like when we, in a course of a 70 or 80 year life, um, even if we've had a relatively smooth life or we feel we have, generally there has been some kind of pain. There's usually been some kind of physical pain at least. Generally there's also been some kind of emotional pain. In addition, we often feel frustrated with, uh, with not knowing enough about life and we, we investigate things and unfortunately a lot of the times we investigate a certain subject and there always seems to be people who say they know about the subject who believe exactly the opposite of another group of people who know about exactly the same subject. Have you noticed that? With every subject you could ever choose to investigate. Even if it's a scientific subject you often see that occurring where this group of scientists believe one thing, this other group of scientists believe another thing about exactly the same subject. And they both believe different things. And that causes us so much frustration as well, doesn't it, generally? We, we end up feeling like, well, how, do we ever, how can we ever know the truth if that's the way it is? Like, and we start believing even that there's no way that truth is available to us even. We even go down the track of feeling in the end hopeless about our desire for truth. And in this process, there's also some emotional pain as well, where we start to wonder, well, is it really worthwhile finding out about these bigger things in life? You know, maybe the best thing we need to do is just live our life and then we die, and, and hopefully we find out after we've, dead, after we've died, something different exists. And unfortunately, many of us even come to the viewpoint that, that we don't even believe there is something after we die. We start to, you know, and many, many, much of mankind believes that after you die, you're just dead. And there's no advantage of doing anything right or wrong or good or bad or anything like that. Because in the end, we're all just dead anyway. And many people have that viewpoint as well. So there's all this sort of emotional turmoil and pain that, that a lot of the times we try to suppress in our life, is it not? Like... So instead of answering questions like all of those kind of questions, we go, well, there's no hope of us ever knowing the answer to those questions, so there's no point in trying to investigate that in any way. My feelings are that a relationship with God can correct all of those things. Firstly, let's look at the physical th side of things. Most of us get sick sometimes in our life, do we not? Most of us have accidents at some point in our life, don't we? And eventually we all die. But in between dying we also grow old. 
wrinkled, don't we? As we grow older, we get more wrinkled and we look at our reflection in the mirror and we go, gee, I wish I had what I know, but the body was still 25. Isn't that how many of us feel when we look in the mirror? We'd like to have what we know or what we've learnt since then, but still, but, but to have the physical fitness to be able to embrace that in, in a more positive way. But we all grow old. Now, I don't know about you, but all of those things, to me, are an indication that something's wrong. Because if God was perfect and all-knowing, and therefore knows how to create a perfect system, it would make sense then that God would know how to create us perfect, and therefore we have the ability to stay perfect forever. We have the ability to stay alive forever. And in fact, scientists have no idea why we die, actually. They've found a gene in the human body that's called the death gene, and they're trying to work with that gene to find out what causes us to die. But there's no real reason that they can find as to why our body can't keep repairing itself and fixing itself up and replenishing itself forever. They don't understand why we die. And I feel that all of that is an indication that God made us to not die. Right? God made us to be perfectly well all the time, <laughs> to never have any accidents, and to never die, and to never grow old. And to me, that is one of the major benefits of a relationship with God, because all of those things are achievable. What about retirement? What about retirement? I, I sort of feel like retirement is something that you could choose to do at any time in your life. <laughs> You've got to make room. <laughs> but the, the beauty, if you look at the universe itself, though, from a purely physical perspective, there is a huge amount of room in the universe. So it's only knowledge that prevents us from embracing these other locations in the universe to even be able to travel there. So there is no real physical reason why we would need to die um, because in the end we could travel to other locations in the universe and be in those locations and live there if we had the knowledge. Um, so I, I sort of see it like there's no reason whatsoever for, for any of us to experience any of those things. All right? So that sounds a bit utopian, does it? Yeah. Well, God makes utopian systems. All right? And so whenever things happen that are out of harmony with the utopian systems, there has to be what I would classify as a scientific reason why it occurs. There has to be a reason why we get sick. There has to be a reason why we have accidents. There has to be a reason why we die. There has to be a reason why we get all wrinkled and grow old even. There has to be reasons. Right? If there's reasons, then surely this relationship with God would teach me the reasons. God would know the reasons, wouldn't he? If God's the creator and the source of all of this life, God would surely know the reasons why these things happen. So it would make sense to me that if I develop my relationship with God, that I will automatically start finding out what the reasons are. And if I know the reasons why these things happen, then I have the ability to correct them, don't I? If I know why they happen, I can correct why they happen so they don't happen anymore. And that is actually the truth. The truth is our, our relationship with God will cause us to finish up understanding the reasons why this painful or suffering-based experience occurs so much that in the end we will no longer get sick, we will no longer have accidents once we engage these reasons, we will no longer have accidents, we will no longer die and we will no longer grow old. So a person who truly engages God for the rest of their existence eventually has the hope that there's no need for them to grow old, no need for them to get sick, no need for them to die. And there are reasons why that happens. And the reasons, if you think about it, have to be something that's out of harmony with God because otherwise, if we're in harmony with God, none of those things would be happening. Does that not make sense, logically? Yeah. 
Now, if that makes sense logically, what finishes up happening for most people is they look at that and they go, yeah, now we're talking about some kind of utopian dream. Right? And in fact, I feel that these things, sickness, accidents, death, growing old, are all many times the reasons why people no longer believe in God, actually. You see that happening quite a lot when you talk to people. When they have an accident, they get sick. and they, There's these things that are happening to them they don't understand. And if they had a faith in God before these things happen, oftentimes they don't have a faith in God afterwards. And, and yet, if God is the creator and source of everything in the universe, including all the energy of the universe, it would make sense that there must be real reasons why all of these things occur. And if I get closer to God and develop a relationship with God, I will get to know all of those reasons. That's one of the, going to be one of the benefits of the relationship with God. And once I understand the reasons, I can then apply them and therefore never get sick again. And I can apply another thing and never finish up having accidents all the time. And I can apply another thing and eventually uh, my body, instead of growing old, starts growing young again. Now that, that is our potential. And scientists don't understand why we don't do it. They haven't discovered the reasons, but there must be a reason. Now scientists are looking for the reasons by experimenting. I'm saying... If we find the reason by connecting with God and ask, letting God tell us the reasons, then we'll know a lot sooner what the reason was as to those events occurring. And once we know the reasons, we then have the ability to correct them, to correct the underlying cause so it doesn't happen anymore. Can everyone see that? Yeah. That's a major benefit, in my mind, of having a relationship with God. A major benefit is all the pain and suffering in my life that I currently experience can all be erased if I understand the reasons why it occurs and if I, if I have this relationship with God, I will eventually understand the reasons why it occurs and therefore cure every one of those things. Let's look at it from a, uh, from a different perspective, uh, a spiritual perspective. After a while in this relationship with God, I come to understand that not only do I have a physical body, physical body, but also have a, another body, a spiritual body. This is the body that when I die, my physical body dies, I start experiencing my existence through my spiritual body. So I start understanding that I actually am now a spirit once, I've, once the physical body has died. That being the case, the things that affected the physical body, which we just talked about, the pain, the suffering, the accidents, the, you know, the sickness and all those kind of things, obviously there must be things that affect the spiritual body. And in my relationship with God, I can start getting to know what those particular things are that affect the flow of energy in my spiritual body, the things that affect me spiritually. And so what I start to see through this relationship with God is that I don't just have one body anymore, I have two. And in fact, there is even a third thing that I have. <laughs> but we haven't discovered that yet, we might say. Initially we usually discover there's a spirit body. And then we start understanding how this spiritual body works, how the actual body itself, the spiritual body, the second body that we actually have, which is all of us right now have, and even all of the spirits that are with us here today have as well, um, we start understanding how it works. So when it has different problems in it, energetically, energetic flow problems in it, we can start understanding the reasons for it. What is actually occurring? What's the underlying reasons why this spiritual body is not functioning properly? So just as there are pains in our physical body, there, are also pain in, there is also pain in our spiritual body that we can begin to address and understand. We can understand why the energy doesn't seem to flow in certain parts. We also see the relationship between the spiritual body and what happens in the flow of the energy of the spiritual body and the effect that that has on the physical body. 
In other words, when we've got problems in different parts of our body, like with our heart or with our bow or with any other problems in our body, with our arm, our shoulder, all sorts of pains and different problems that we tend to get, we start to see a relationship between what's going on in this body and how it affects, sorry, what's going on in the other way around, how, what's going on in the, phys- the spiritual body and how it affects the physical body. So we start learning about things like energy and how it flows. And we start being able to do things with this spirit body, including travel with it. Right? So, for example, I, I know farmers who now, they check their fences not by driving their four-wheel drive over all their fences, but they, they lay down on their bed and they go out of their physical body into their spiritual body and then they fly over all of their fences and they check their fences. And any that are broken, they know exactly where to drive to. And sure enough, they drive straight there and that's where it's broken. <laughs> and they fix that up. And it saves them lots and lots of time. <laughs> right? Because they understand how the spirit body works and what goes on with the spirit body and how you can utilise your spirit body in terms of experiencing your life. Then even further to that, we start discovering through this relationship with God that we actually are also one half of a soul. So in other words, there's my body, physical body, and there's my spiritual body, And then I'm one half of a soul. And after a while I start understanding that there's another half of my soul, that it fits perfectly with my soul. It's made just for me, the other half of myself. My soul mate, if you like, my other half. And in her case, in my case it's a her, a she, she has a spirit body and a physical body. of her own that she can learn how to use as well in exactly the same way that I have. And there is also a way for us to come closer together as well where we have a relationship, where we have a flow of things going on. And we start to see the relationship between the soul and all of the other things that are happening to my two bodies. So I see the relationship between the soul and the two bodies that I own the spirit body and the physical body. And I understand, start to understand the, crea- the creator of all of my sickness, all of my accidents, my old age, and everything else that happens to me is my own soul. That's the creator of it. And in this relationship with God, God teaches me this process of understanding the causes of what's really going on inside of the soul and how it affects the rest of my life. So you imagine for most of us, if you, if you could cast your mind back over your life for a minute and you could rub out every single negative, painful event that happened to your physical body. Imagine that for a moment. You could reverse the ageing process and look 25 when you look in the mirror you imagine that for a moment and you never have an accident again no matter what you do you never seem to have an accident because you know how to control your bodies and you know the space in which your bodies are and so you therefore never get damaged through it right. now you imagine if all of those things had changed in your life and you look back on your life in comparison to looking back on your life as it has been can you see some major benefits surely there's a lot of major benefits if that was, a, if that was achievable. Yeah. And what I'm saying is through the relationship with God, that is achievable. It is achievable to have those things. In fact, it's not only just achievable for you, the one half of yourself. It's also achievable where you can understand it so much that you can actually heal other people's bodies through the actions that you take where you can actually heal the bodies of animals and other creatures as well through the actions you take. So it not only then benefits you, but it benefits absolutely everybody who ever comes in contact with you. 
by understanding that knowledge. Now, to me, that's a major benefit of the relationship we've got. I'm just talking about the, the physical body. Mm -hmm. um, so are you saying if we have a connection with God, then let's say somebody of 70 years old would over time start to look 25, and if they had grey hair, it would go brown again or whatever colour it was at birth? And yes. Actually. Yes. Wow. Yes. Um, Mary and I have noticed a lot of that happening already, like in our bodies. Like with me, um, I had a period of time where I started going grey. And, um, and, and now when I look at my grey hairs, a lot of times I pull out the grey hair and the end of the hair is grey, but the rest of it's now going brown again. Does that make sense? Yeah. So as, the, as you deal with different things, there's the different causes for each of these things, all of a sudden things will start changing in your own body. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 So, so a person whose body isn't changing, immediately that tells me their relationship with God is not developing. Because if your relationship with God develops and, and, and grows, your body will change. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Automatically. Yeah. There you go. Uh, what about things like uh, severed limbs? Can they grow back? Yes, they can. Uh, and uh, surgically Im uh, implanted metals, you know, from surgically, you know, false teeth, how, how that... Yes. No, your body can also uh, destroy them and get rid of them. Wow. Because it doesn't need them anymore. Yep. There's all sorts of things that can happen to your body as a result of your relationship with God. And, and, and the reality is that every single person who exists in the eighth dimension of the spirit world, in a, a one condition with God, they all have no physical deformities in their body. Not, not a single one of them have any physical deformity. They have no wrinkles. They are perfectly able to use their body perfectly complete and completely. In the lower dimensions of the spirit world, there are plenty of people with wrinkles still, and there's plenty of people with, who, who are still old and still have sicknesses and still have hurts in different parts of their body. But once you reach that at one month's condition with God, then all of those things are completely gone. What about things like caps on your teeth? Well, once you reach the abundant condition, you, you can grow new teeth. Well, you think about it. When you were little, and when you were like two, three, four, five years of age, right, you had one set of teeth, right? Now, they all dropped out, and you didn't freak out about it, did you? Yeah, you didn't, weren't concerned about that because you, your body grew another set. <laughs> the tooth fairy, yeah. You, you didn't freak out about it. Your body grew another set of teeth. Why doesn't your body grow another set of teeth after that and another set of teeth after that and another set of teeth after that? Can you see logically there's no reason why the body can't do it? Can you see that? There must be a reason why it stops growing teeth. You, your teeth grind down, don't they? They wear out. It would make sense that your body would just drop a set and give you a new set every time you needed a new set. Wouldn't that not make sense? And yes, when you're at one with God, that's exactly what happens. Your teeth start falling out and you'll get new teeth. <laughs> you won't have the old teeth that you had anymore. Is it necessary to have a relationship with your soulmate on any level to fully develop? Well, the, the short answer is yes. The reason why is because they are the other half of you. So how are you going to discover you without the other half of you being present? Uh, so it's got to be phys physical and spiritual? Uh, yes, so the person might, be in a, in the, might have died already. But you can still have a physical and spiritual relationship with them. Yes? Yeah. And you will need to do so if you want to continue to grow. Because they are the other half of you. They are, you know, if, you have, if you're not having a relationship with them, you're yet to discover at least half of yourself. Which, so, you know, we, we can discover everything about ourselves, but if we're not discovering the other half of ourselves, we've still got half of ourselves all shut down, really. If we um, just use the microphone, that'd be good. Eric. How did the split occur? The split occurred at incarnation. The very first moment we were conceived, the way God created souls was that souls are created 
together as one unit and then at incarnation one half of the soul uh, once you know once the bodies are conceived and remember there's two bodies that are conceived the half of the soul splits from the other half of the soul and incarnates and becomes half of the half of the soul now being expressed on earth and in the spirit world and the other half of the soul at some point after that does the same thing All right. and the incarnation process is a natural process of our growth so that's what happens when we first incarnate that's what I'd call incarnation and that's really the process of getting to know ourselves we get to know in this case the masculine part of ourselves and then this person gets to know the feminine part of herself and then by having a relationship I get to know the other the feminine half of myself through that relationship and she gets to know the masculine half of herself through the relationship and eventually we will eventually grow and become one again but fully realized we, we fully know who we are now if we don't engage one half of our soul <laughs> Can you see it's impossible for us to get to know at least half of ourselves? So you know, it's going to be very, a bit difficult for us to know ourselves completely while the other half of our soul is being rejected. Okay. So how do we know who our other half is? Well, that's a question for another discussion because we're focused here on our relationship with God. Um, the, the, I have had some discussions about that. There's a series of talks I gave uh, called The Human Soul. Um, these are downloadable on YouTube. And the series of talks is called The Soulmate Relationship. And it discusses um, how we incarnate right the way through to how we can discover the other half of ourselves through the process of embracing our life and embracing our desires. There are two sessions to it, I think you'll find. There's session one and session two. There's, so there's four talks that are a part of that. Yep. So you have to listen to about 10 hours of material <laughs> to, for that. But what I'm saying is the relationship with God automatically causes us to be more and more open to our other half of ourselves. Now, if I can explain how that occurs. Remember I said that the half of myself, this is me, and this is my other half, which, which in my case is a she. So me and she. <laughs> All right? So that's Mary over there. Now, if I grow towards God, because God's not injured in love in any way, Right. As I grow towards God, I have to become less injured in love in order to get closer to God. So I'll be less injured in love. Is that all right? It makes sense, doesn't it? As I grow towards God, to have a closer relationship with God, I will have to learn things about love that I didn't know before. And in the process of learning things about love that I didn't know before, I become less injured in love. Yes. So, since I become less injured in love, I become more open towards anybody who wants to love me. Can you not see that? I am no longer uh, worried about the risk of love or the worried about getting hurt or worried about what will happen to me if I fall in love and, and what they might do with that. You know, I won't worry about any of those things because I am less injured in love. I don't have the feelings like that anymore where I'm worried about taking a risk and I'm worried about being rejected and all those things. Those, all of those things disappear from me as my relationship with God grows. Since it disappears from me, it's like I have my arms now. Initially, I'm, I'm like this, trying to protect my heart from anybody getting hurting it. And eventually, you could liken as you grow in love and you release more and more of your injuries about love, it's like your arms become open. Your, your heart now is also open. So your heart is now open towards the other half of yourself. Now that's going to be, the other half of yourself is going to find that very attractive. Yeah. Because there's no, they're, no longer, they're no longer closed 
and they've no longer been closed down by us, but rather with a, we want to embrace them. We want to get closer to them. So in my relationship with God growing, my heart automatically becomes open because I've become less injured in love. My heart automatically becomes open to the other half of myself. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to, my, due to this openness, the other half of myself will feel a pull of attraction towards me. Whether she likes it or not, or he likes it or not, she's going to be attracted because she is, after all, he is, after all, the other half of you. So of course they're going to be attracted. So the beauty of getting the way that I get the other half of myself close to me is by getting closer to God and through that relationship removing the emotional injuries that cause me to be blocked in love. And the more I remove those emotional injuries that block my love and block the flow of love into me, the less impediments there are to having a relationship with another person on earth or in the spirit world who is the other half of myself. Yeah. Okay, can, I, hello. can I just ask you, how come, like we know many people um, who have been practising um, what you're saying for a few years now, um, who believe themselves to be soulmates. And how have they attracted their soulmate without actually doing much of this work? Like they're only in the, in the initial stages probably of, of, of going through right. a lot of this. Well, firstly, a belief is not a truth. So just because I believe somebody is my soulmate, it doesn't make it true. That's number one. There are many times where people believe a certain person is the other half of themselves, but then as they progress towards God further, they realise that that person wasn't, and the only thing that attracted them to that person was in some emotional addictions that they had. That once they become more loving, they realise that person wasn't the person who they believed them to be. Now, my, my feelings are, most people who believe they know who their soulmates are, don't know. That's the reality. And the reason why they don't know is because they're still carrying injuries of love themselves, which prevent them from knowing. That also prevent them from attracting their soulmate. Now, it could be, of course, that spirits around the person, so imagine this is me here, it could be that I have a friend who's in the spirit world who thinks he's my friend, tell me that this person over here is my soulmate, right? So he tells me that. Well, I wouldn't call that knowing. And I'd call that just a belief, and it's not necessarily a truth. It could be that that person likes that woman so much that he thinks that she should be with you. <laughs> and so a lot of people have those kind of interactions occurring as well. To truly know who your soulmate is, you must grow in love. And if you haven't grown in love, in particular with regard to the gender-based differences between a male and female in terms of... and understand the gender emotional injuries you have. So in other words, I need to understand the emotional injuries I have with my dad and I need to understand the emotional injuries I have with my mum. And once I release a fair portion of those emotional injuries, my soulmate will be attracted to me and if I release a fair portion of his injuries, I'll be able to see that person and I can feel, yes, it's not that I like them, it's that I can feel they are the other half of me. They have exactly the same attributes and qualities that I actually have. They have the same almost personality that what I have, but expressed in a feminine form. They also have a very, very similar um, nature uh, that I have. They have very similar desires and passions that I have. In fact, almost exactly the same ones that I have, they have. And you are able to see that once you've released these injuries. Right? If we have not released these injuries, then any belief that we have about somebody being our soulmate or not is just a belief and we must remind ourselves that it's not a truth. Right. It, it potentially is a truth, but it doesn't mean it is a truth just because I believe it. Yeah. 
And I feel the majority of people who say they've been practicing a lot of the things I've been teaching have not released many of their mum and dad based emotional injuries. Because to release those injuries, you've got to go through a process. There's usually a process of fear that you've got to work your way through because you're, you're terrified about becoming yourself and you're terrified about what everybody else will think about you becoming yourself and you start to go through this process of, of you know, working on yourself. You, because of that, will go through a lot of what are called addictions You'll work, you know, you'll find that you have an emotional addiction to this kind of person, an emotional addiction to that kind of person. So, for example, if you're a male, you might realise that you have an emotional addiction to any woman that's nice and soft and gentle. And there's a reason for that. Now, what if your soulmate's not nice and soft and gentle? And, of course, you'll never see her because you, you, your attraction, based on an injury that you have, is just to that kind of a woman. Or you might even just be attracted to a certain height woman with a certain body shape and not attracted to any other woman who has a different height and a different body shape. Or you might only be attracted to people who you know, do a certain type of job or whatever. And all of these attractions that we have on the planet, most of them are injury-based attractions. Once you work through the fears, addictions that you have and get down into the grief of those things, then you become more and more open to knowing who it is. And that's not the same as a belief. Knowing is all about basically God showing you who it is through a process which demonstrates to you that the person has the same nature as you, the same personality as you, the same desires and passions as you, just expressed in a different body. And once that occurs, you recognise the person very easily. But to, to be honest, it took me 15 years of emotional work to get to that point where I could recognise my soulmate easily. And in between that time, there were a couple of times when I thought somebody was my soulmate or somebody told me they were. And, and I might have believed them for a short period of time and then I worked through something and then I realised, no, that person's not. Does that make sense? And so I feel a lot of people on earth, they want to know the answer to the question, but they don't want to engage their relationship with God to cure the unloving emotions. The beauty of the relationship with God is I become less injured in love, so therefore I can then... I am releasing these emotions that I have with my mum and dad that cause me to be injured in love. And I have to work my way through fear as an emotional experience. I have to work my way through my addictions as an emotional experience. And I have to work my way through childhood grief as an emotional experience. And once I do that, I'm now, I'm, I can now see very clearly who I'm looking at, not seeing them physically, but actually feeling them emotionally. And once I get to that point, I can recognise who my soulmate is. Now, for the majority of people who are in the spirit world, that only happens when they're in the fifth dimension of the spirit world. Most people who pass from this earth pass over into the first dimension of the spirit world. And so that means there's four or five more levels of growing in love that they need to make before they'll even see their soulmate. And in the spirit world, I've been involved with showing somebody their soulmate and they've totally rejected it. So I've actually sh taken somebody to somebody else and said, look, this is your soulmate. And they look at the other person and say, yeah, really? No, I don't think so. <laughs> and then gone away. And some of them have gone away for hundreds of years from that person. Like, not, not, because they don't want to grow towards God. They're not refining their love. And as a result, they stay stagnant in a dimension that they preventing them, preventing themselves from ever discovering the other half of themselves. So I've seen that happen many times. Can you temporarily know, though, like um, sometimes um, with me and my partner, we, we'll go through an emotion and then we can feel the love through the truth and, and the experiencing the error. You can feel the love. Can I give you a straight answer? Yeah. No, you okay. can't temporarily know. If you temporarily know, it's because you have a belief. Not, not a truth. See, the, the way that the truth enters you from God is that once the truth enters you from God, you know for certain. And, and in fact, you, it's proven to you for certain as well. So you don't, your, your belief doesn't shake. 
It, it doesn't go yes, no, yes, no anymore. It goes, no, I know exactly the truth on that particular issue now. Now, up until that time, we're in a process of experimenting. Up until that time, we're in, in a process of working through beliefs, you know, relating to these emotions that cause us to not know. But once we've worked through us to a certain point in time, we will always finish up knowing for certain. And once we know for certain, we will not shake in that belief. It's not, we won't go, no, I don't believe it now, or yes, I do, or some stress comes along, we won't change our mind. Um, that's the way it will be once we truly do know and have been told from, from our relationship with God. Most people don't allow that to occur because they'd like to believe somebody is their soulmate under certain conditions and then under other conditions they'd like to believe they're not. So I've actually gone through that emotionally too where you know somebody treats you nicely so you'd like to believe that they're your soulmate and then they treat you badly so you'd hope they're not your soulmate and you cycle through those particular things too. That's not what it's like when God, through the relationship, tells you who your, relation, who, who your soulmate is. When God tells you, from that point on, it is very, very certain and solidified within you. And it's impossible for anybody to shake you because you know for certain this person, this other person that's the other half of you. Does that make sense, Sally? So, so don't... Uh, if, if there is this feeling of oh, sometimes I believe they are and sometimes I believe they aren't, then you're best going down the track of saying to yourself, well, obviously we don't know that truth yet. And the only reason why we don't know a truth yet is because we are blocking God from telling us the truth through an emotion. That's the only reason why we don't know something. So what we'd need to do there is talk to God about what are we blocking? What, what, what is it that causes us to, to not know sometimes and know other times and, and then have our changing mind. Because the reality is once uh, we're, f we're in a connection with God on the subject, our mind does not change after that point. God knows. Remember I said earlier that God knows what is really true, what, what is really, really the case. Right? God knows it. And once I am connected with God enough on a particular subject and remember there's millions of subjects you can be connected to God about so you can actually be connected to God on one subject but totally disconnected from God on another subject based on different emotional feelings that you have in you that prevent you from connecting but once you connect with God on a particular subject God through that connection will tell you the truth it will solidify in your heart you won't be shaken after that nobody will come along and say oh, I think I'm your son and you go oh maybe they are you know, nothing like that would ever happen again if God has actually been involved in this process with you. So if that is not the case, then you've got to say, okay, the fact is that my belief is changing. So you've got to be honest about that. And then understand that if my belief is changing, that it can't be a truth yet. It's just something that I have to put on the side and say, I'm yet to resolve this yet as truth or not truth. And that's the best way to approach it. Now, the earlier question, which was the question associated with many people have been following the path for some time and they still and they believe they know who their soulmate is, my answer to that is that most people who believe they know who their soulmate is don't know yet. Now, some of them have been told by spirits, like I said, around them or something like that, but that doesn't make it the truth either. It has to be a truth that comes to you through your relationship with God. And then you'll know for certain. Oh, I was just thinking that the soulmates have to be the same physical age. No. No, they don't. Um, the, the way the incarnation occurs is the first half of the soul incarnates and the second half of the soul follows the first half of the soul around until it has the opportunity to incarnate. And while that is the case, that you may finish up being, there might be eventually 20 years apart. It just depends on you know, when the second part of the soul has the opportunity to incarnate. So, um, but most soulmates are usually five to ten years you know, in, that, in that range. Um, obviously, the further distance away, the less souls are in that range. So most souls are in the sort of, you know, within five to ten years of incarnating with each other. And it doesn't also, uh, it could be that our soulmate is incarnated and then died. And so they're now in the spirit world 
And, uh, and so, but we can still find them and we can still draw them to us and we can still have a relationship with them. So, and, and as we get less injured in love, those relationships can develop. So very powerful, very powerful tool. Um, did you say earlier that if our soulmates died, that you can have a physical relationship with them even if we're on Earth? Yeah. How does that happen? Well, well, we understand that every single person in the spirit world, you remember there's different spheres or dimensions in the spirit world. Let's draw them line linearly. So let's say there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. There's many, many dimensions, right? Now, as, as your soulmate grows, they actually enter these different dimensions as they grow in love, right? They will enter a different dimension. Now, once you get to the third dimension of the spirit world, there is the ability to materialize a body. Right? For short periods of time. As you grow in these different dimensions of love, once you get to the fifth dimension, you can materialize a body for a, a, a fair long portion of the day. For example, you know, three, four, five hours at a time. Because it takes energy to do that. Once you become at one with God, which is in the eighth dimension, you can materialize a body for as long as you wish to use it. So I don't understand about this materialize. When you materialize a can body, you use the mic for mean you materialize a body on these other dim ethereal dimensions? Yeah, once you, once you progress in the, in the spirit world after you've died... I thought everyone had a body up there anyway. They have a spirit body. Yes. Yes, but you can materialise a physical body... Well, for, for use down here? For use down so on the earth. So you can appear to somebody? You can appear to somebody. Like the woman who appeared to Kubler-Ross. Exactly. Right. I remember yes. that story? Yes. Right. Yes. And there's, a, there's many people who have had appearances of pe spirits who, who have appeared on earth... And they've only appeared generally for short periods of time because it requires amounts of energy to maintain these connections. Mm -hmm. But as we grow in love, we can maintain these bodies on earth. So if your soulmate had passed and they grew in love towards God to such an extent, you know, to the seventh or eighth dimension where they could maintain a physical body, you can have a physical relationship with them. About that guy, Bapaji, who doesn't die. Um, well, that's not strictly true. There's a lot of false information about him, and I think we well, can... Well, I read it in Yogananda, the autobiography of Yogananda. Yeah, like it seemed, I say... It seemed fairly authentic. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that seem authentic from spiritual experiences, but there are other explanations for the experience, and I'd probably prefer... I've described them in other talks, but on this one I want to focus on relationship with God, if we can. Is that all right? Yep. And is it, I, I can't remember if I've, you've ever actually said, is it 10% of gays, um, souls are gay? Is it 10%? Or no, I haven't given a percentage. Oh. Remember that every single soul, as I've previously described, has, has a varying amount of masculinity and femininity. This is the complete soul in it. So if it was half and half and the soul splits, then it is a likelihood that half will be a male and half will be a female. But some souls have less masculinity in them and more femininity, right? So that's the amount of masculinity and more femininity as a complete soul. So when that splits in half, there will be mostly it'll be attracted to two female forms. Now that being the case, the 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 both halves of the soul will be attracted to a female form, so that you'd classify them as a lesbian, right? But but they are just two halves of the soul attracted to, sp to physical bodies and spirit bodies that are feminine in nature to express themselves in their femininity. And, and as a result of that, um, they will then be soulmates still. Right? Now, in terms of how often it happens, like if we look at a standard distribution curve of anything that ever happens, of any particular event that any ever occurs in the, w in the universe, there is always a certain percentile range where things fit where 90% of the people fit in, in, in amongst a certain range and, and others fit in a different range. If you think about it from God's perspective, from a mathematical perspective, there are potentially souls that have almost no masculinity in them and only femininity in them. And there are potentially souls that almost have no femininity in them and are totally masculine. 
and there are, percentage, there are so, potentiality of any soul in between that two, those two ranges. So if you look at the range of potentials with regard to a soul, so here's the range of potential. Let's say this is 100% male, and on this end we've got 100%, this is for the whole soul, not for the two halves, the whole unit, 100% female. 100% male then obviously there is a potential for any single person in this audience to fall within that range as a half of the soul. Does that make sense? And rather than trying to work out how many percentages are what, does it, like, like you're really asking you know, how long is a piece of string. The, main, the more important question is, what is my attraction? <laughs> That's the most important question. And if my attraction, if I'm a male and my attraction is a male, then that tells me, unless there's some emotional injuries, which I will find in my progression towards God, sooner or later anyway, um, unless there's emotional injuries, that tells me the other half of my soul is male as well. Does that make sense? And rather than worrying about the percentage, which is all about emotional injury actually, the emotional injury is you'd like there to be a certain number of percentages so you don't feel so unique having a gay soul. Does that make sense? Um, and the key is that that is an emotional injury. And I understand the emotional injury because there are many people on this planet who treat gay people very badly. And as a result, we have a lot of emotional injuries in the gay population because of how badly they get treated. Yeah? But, but in a purely loving environment, gay people would not get treated badly, ever. And so therefore, they wouldn't have that injury where they're worried about how many of percentage there is of gay people in comparison to heterosexual people. And I don't even see them as gay versus heterosexual or homosexual versus heterosexual. I just see it as a single soul attraction to your mate, whatever gender your mate is. That's it. And you will only, once you progress in your relationship with God, you'll go beyond attraction to any other person other than your mate. So you'll get, one in, as you grow in your relationship with God, you'll get to the point where you no longer feel sexual attraction to any other half of the soul other than your mate. Does that make sense? It doesn't matter who, whether they're male or female, whoever they are, they're the only person you'll actually feel a sexual attraction for. Yeah. And that's what will eventually happen once you progress in the relationship with God. And with myself... Mm -hmm. my other half being female, mm -hmm. um, I still need to work through the father issues as well as the mother issues. Of course. Because both of those um, genders created injury in myself, love it, towards love and, and going towards, towards yourself, God. Your attitude towards yourself and your attitude towards masculinity and your mm -hmm. attitude towards femininity were all injured in, in, a, in a way. So if you think about how your parents treated you, um, and, and I know you a little, so we, we can discuss that a little bit. You can see that often they treated you with a lot, like when, when you sort of announced that you felt you had a female attraction, how did they respond? Well, my mother didn't talk to me for six months. Okay, so, so mum obviously had a lot of trouble with that, and she wasn't in a state of love with that. What happened with your dad? Well, he was into sexual... Um Deviation, part of sexual, everything, so... So he was sort of like bisexual, do anything No, he anyone, was or? very heterosexual so and there was a very strong... So he uh, treated women badly? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and so eventually when I was... I was, I, I was so freaked out about telling them that I was quite old when I did. Of course. So by then he was into a laissez-faire attitude towards everything, but... But the reality is, if you look at the emotion, your mum rejected you as a woman as a result of your de declaration. And your father only accepted it because he actually had a terrible way of treating women in the first place. Which are both going to define how you see yourself. And because of those injuries, unless they're released, there's going to be a lot of rejection of the other half of yourself, no matter who that is. At the moment, I would say you're rejecting yourself quite a lot. And as a result of that, how can you expect your soulmate to accept you when you or you even feel the feelings of acceptance from your soulmate when you are rejecting yourself so much? 
Does that make sense? So, so can you see the beauty of the relationship with God? If we forget about that relationship for a moment and we focus on this relationship with God, and that's me, as I work through all of my unhealed, so there'll be all these unhealed emotional injuries about love, I become healed. I heal myself emotionally, heal myself. Once I'm healed with love, once I am in this state where I'm completely open and expansive with love, it's going to be, my soulmate's going to find that very attractive, no matter where they are. So they will be attracted into our, into our life. The soulmate attraction is one of the strongest attractions, but it grows exponentially as you grow towards God. So that's why most people do finish up discovering their soulmate. When I say most, every single person who's ever grown towards God finishes up finding out who their soulmate is. And my resistance to the mother God, mm -hmm. um, that feels like that's still strong. Yes. Is that to do with my mother not accepting myself as a gay soul or just my mother not accepting me um, because well, it, of other things? Or? Yeah, if you look at your mum, she never, she never accepted you sexually. But she also never, when I say accepted you, accepted your sexual orientation. But she also never accepted you in so many other ways. Yes. Is that not true? That's right. So, so, so now you project that, instead of saying, Mum, you did these things to me, you're really going like, God, you did these things to me. Right? And that, of course, prevents the relationship with God. So God doesn't feel the way your mum feels. But you believe God feels the way your mum feels. And as you release that emotionally, you have less blockages to receiving love from God and therefore accepting yourself sexually and otherwise. And once you do that, it doesn't matter whether your mum accepts you or not, you are now completely open to accepting the feminine side of yourself, right? Now, if your soulmate's feminine, you're also then more open to accepting her as well as a, as a part of that process. Yeah. So the best possible action we could take is to focus on our relationship with God if we really want to find our soulmate. It's the best possible action. Thank you very much. Yep. And that is one of the eternal benefits. And the, It's an eternal benefit because that, once you meet your soulmate and you engage the relationship, the soul then starts to unify again. So it starts to join back together. So remember how I drew us separate here? because of different emotional reasons and injuries that we have, as we grow towards God, we eventually get to the point where we recombine as a unit, at a soul level. And the beauty of that is that that complete soul has the ability to grow even more exponentially than the two halves have the ability to grow separately. So there are even more benefits to having this attraction satisfied through this relationship with God than what anybody on earth has, have, has ever realised. There has been no one on earth who has ever been in a soul union condition with their soulmate, historically. There are only a few people in the spirit world who are. Sorry, who are what? In a soul union condition. I call that a soul union condition. This is very rare. It's very rare. And the main reason why it's very rare is because most people want to hold on to their emotional injuries about the opposite gender. Most people don't want to work through their stuff with their mum and their dad and, and they want to have their own lives and they don't want to join together and all those kind of things. And so most people maintain a separateness for a long period of time. You don't need to do that, but, but most people do. And, and nobody has ever joined together while they're on earth. There are people in the spirit world who have but nobody historically on this earth has joined together. So we don't even know what a proper soulmate relationship looks like at this point on earth. Does that make sense? Yeah, far away. <laughs> Sorry for hogging space. Um, is it still, it's still a good idea, though, I, I understand, to be praying to God or longing to God uh, for my soulmate connection to open, even if I'm very injured and... and uh. Yes, but you've got to be careful about fooling yourself on this matter. 
Because, because while you still have all of these, this anger and resentment and other emotions towards mum, how can you at the same time be holding on to those while at the same time trying to pray to God that you know, you're open to your soulmate? Can you see there has to be a willingness to address these emotions? And if you're not willing to address the emotion, you're better off saying to God, look, I'm not willing to address my emotions, so obviously I'm never going to meet my soulmate. <laughs> then you are going, because truth is a part of this relationship with God. You need to be truthful. The reality is that if there is anger or resentment or other types of emotions towards any gender, mum or dad types of genders, then, then of course they will be imposed upon your relationship with God and with your soulmate. And you can pray that you meet your soulmate, you know, have a longing to meet your soulmate, but if you don't have a longing to address those emotional injuries, you're not going to meet your soulmate. So my suggestion is to focus on addressing the emotional injuries in a pure and sincere way with regard to mum and dad. Stop putting it off, stop trying to put it on the back shelf and hope it will go away when you meet your soulmate because you're not going to meet your soulmate while it's there. The law of attraction will keep you apart until such a time as you would deal with the issue. So address the issue that's actually there. It's very hypocritical to pray to God for something to happen while at the same time rejecting God's truth on that particular thing. Now God sees straight through us every single time. Right? So God knows when we're being sincere and God knows when we're not, even though we might not know. So if I'm longing for my soulmate and I'm not meeting her or him, I am obviously not being sincere. And if I'm not being sincere, I need to address the reasons why. And every single time, it will relate to pain that I don't want to feel relating to something that happened in my past that I need to address, that I need to be sincere about. So just be very, very careful of having a longing in one direction while at the same time denying a whole series of emotions that would help you in that direction. Because that, that's not a sincere place, that's a hypocritical place and that's going to cause your own stagnation. Because in the end you will not get closer to God like that or closer to your soulmate or closer to yourself. The beauty of this growth towards God is that you always get closer towards yourself. Always. Which also means you always get closer to the other half of yourself. Always. If, if you, but if you're hypocritical or you try to fool yourself or you try to avoid pain in the process, then it's not going to happen. And what I find is the majority of people say they have a longing for their soulmate, but the reality is they don't have a longing for their soulmate at all. They are needy. All right? not, and neediness is not a longing. You know what neediness is? Neediness is a desire to have your addictions met. And that is not loving. When we truly have a longing for our soulmate, we will be desirous of giving the gift of ourselves to them. Right? We will not be in a needy place for getting anything back from them. Right? And I find the majority of people who say they have a longing for their soulmate do not have a longing for their soulmate. And instead, they are needy. I personally went through exactly the same experience for nine years. <laughs> it took me to work through my neediness for my soulmate. Once I worked through my neediness for my soulmate, lo and behold, my soulmate enters my life. Are you unified with your soulmate? Sorry? Are you unified with your soulmate? No. Well, not, not on the earth again, no. No? No. no. Not yet? No. Definitely not. Are we, babe? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just um, going back to the soul union state. Yep. Um, just pinged a bit of an idea. Uh, I think you've said it. You know, in the in the spirit world, you drop the spirit body away. But if you go into soul union state here on on the, in the physical realm, are the physical bodies actually going to come together? And I don't know. I just started going. No. Pushing. Remember, remember your physical bodies, both of them. And hers, in your case, yes, both of them, are just bodies. They're not the real you. The real you is this, the soul that you are, or the half of the soul that you are. Does that make sense? That's the real you, this part here. These are just sort of 
robotic <laughs> designs God has made for you to express yourself. This one in the physical world and this one in the spirit world. Does that make sense? So there is no need for the bodies to disappear for the two souls to come together. They are in a different dimension. There is no need for them to disappear. Once they come together, it will be one soul controlling four bodies. Okay. Does that make sense? A lot more sense. Yeah, I started going with crazy ideas. So yeah. yeah, that's better. And potentially this one soul, by the way, and something I haven't discussed with you yet, this one soul can even create even more bodies right. after that. Stop, that's too much. And in fact, you can create <laughs> hundreds of thousands of bodies, depending on the power that you have, to express yourself in individual situations. But you can only do that when you get a certain condition of love in your relationship with God. Does that make sense? Yeah, more so, sense than what I was thinking. Yeah, so, so the reality is when it comes to a soul union occurring on earth, what I expect to happen, even though it's not happened yet on earth, and what I expect to happen is that this one soul will control perfectly the four bodies that are associated with it and then also can potentially create other bodies, physical or spiritual, in order to express itself if it's so desired. Yeah, that's massive. Yeah, that's one of the eternal benefits of having a relationship with God. So in order to do that, the only way is to be in total connection with God on this earth, to have your souls come together. Well, the souls can come together without a total connection with God on the earth, but the likelihood of it happening is far more remote while I or the other half of me retain emotional injuries that block us from coming together. And this is the beauty of my relationship with God. The relationship with God exposes all of my unloving injuries that I have inside of myself, all the belief systems that I have inside of myself that are untrue. All of those things are exploded and, and destroyed through this process. And as a result, I'm left with just the pure, sincere, loving person that I was created to be. And as that occurs, then obviously the attraction between myself and the other half of myself will increase. So, so even if I only release half of those injuries, I have a much greater chance of meeting my soulmate than I had if I didn't release any of those injuries at all. So again, my suggestion is focus number one, relationship with God. Number one priority. Because the beauty of putting it as a number one priority is all these other things will be added to you. you know, all of you at some point want to have a perfect relationship generally. right? That will be added to you if you put your relationship with God as your number one priority. Because in your relationship with God, remember God's not, God hasn't got emotional damages with love. So God can teach you everything about love. God can then cause you to become more loving through that process and, and then you get to the point where you're no longer unloving in any direction. And when you're in that state, it's impossible for the other half of yourself to not be attracted to you at some point. So, so the beauty of putting number one priority as the relationship with God is that it actually creates the ability to attract the other relationship that you're actually looking for. And, and what I feel a lot of people are doing is they're not putting God as the number one priority. What they do is they put their earth-based relationship, oftentimes. So, so looking for their soulmate is their number one priority. And then number two sometimes is God. But usually when soulmates first, number two comes right down here somewhere. God, God comes right down in the list. The problem with that is that your soulmate is most probably going to be injured in love. And if that is the case, you're going to meet your soulmate at some point. If you grow enough, you'll meet your soulmate. But because you're both injured in love and not growing towards somebody who isn't injured in love, you're going to act out these unloving things with each other. That's not going to be very good for your soulmate relationship. Does that make sense? But, but if you put God first... So if, if God's first and then your self, or which is the, you and the other half of yourself is second, at least, right? this, is, um, this is both halves now we're talking about of our self. Remember, we are a half of our true self. When we do it like that, 
We're always going to learn from God, always going to grow towards God, no matter what our soulmate does. And as a result of that, we're always going to finish up attracting our soulmate, no matter what our soulmate does about it. We're always going to finish up attracting them. And the beauty of it too is that we will be in such a condition of love when we meet them that we'll be able to maintain the relationship without it causing us too much pain. Because if we can't do that, the relationship will cause us a lot of pain and that will cause us to want to split apart. And then, and then we might finish up going like this with our summit, together, apart, together, apart. <laughs> you know, for many, many years causing each other a lot of pain because we're not growing towards God. It's, it's the relationship with God that will refine us so much that we'll no longer have pain in any other relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, it's interesting that we're focused on the soul. Like, you all lit up once we talked about the soulmate to a large degree, right? Now, what does that tell us? That tells us that most probably, for many of us, the, rela- the, the priority system isn't that, but the priority system is more this. Right? And that, that is going to be, be a problem for us. Because at some point, we'll stagnate in our relationship with our soulmate if we're not continually progressing towards God. God will teach us everything we need to know, even about our own selves, even about the other half of ourselves. As we develop our relationship with God, our relationship with the other half of ourselves has the ability to grow and change. Does that, everyone guess that? Yeah. So we, if we focus on soulmate first, rather than focusing on God first... God will not be able to refine our unloving behaviours so that when we do meet our soulmate, even if we focus on our soulmate first, we might meet our soulmate, it's going to be a very unloving relationship because we're not yet refined enough to maintain the relationship. If we put God first, God is refining us in love. As God refines us in love and purifies our love, when we meet our soulmate, we have the ability to maintain love for our soulmate, even if they cheat on us, and even if they hate us, and even if they, you know, don't like what we do with our life, and even if they want to punish us, and even if they want to do things to hurt us, we'll still be able to maintain a loving state with them. Can you see? Because our soulmates might not be in that good condition, right? You think about it. Our soulmates might be full of rage and anger when you meet them. They might. You know, some, for some of us, we've got soulmates that are murderers, some of us. Yeah. So they're not going to be in that good a condition of love when we first meet them. And if we haven't refined our own condition of love with regard to our relationship with God, then it's going to be a pretty hard time with that person if, if, if we haven't refined the love that's in us. That's why this is always the better course of action. Well, it's probably time to have a bit of a break, is it? Do you feel? We have a break and go to the loo and those kind of things. Um, There is also some snacks up the back that some people have brought that you might like to share in. And we'll start again in another half hour, three quarters of an hour from now um, and go and proceed with the discussion.